Thanks. Awesome. All right. So let's get going. Um, I appreciate your time. Thanks for being here. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll get going on uh, the questions that were asked this time. Let me go ahead and minimize that. There we go. Um, okay. It had some really good questions this time. Um, had amazing questions last time too, but um, I really liked the the questions that were sent in this go around. So like I did the past couple of times, I just put them into a little deck um, and we'll just start talking through them. So here we go. Um, same disclaimer as usual. Um, all right. So first question here, I just started using StemPod, right? So that's our, um, the pulsed radio frequency device that um, we started using a few years ago and we use it in several different ways. Um, one's to help with primitive reflex integration. One is, you know, one way is for the vagus nerve, uh, via several different methods, but most commonly through the symbaconscia in the ear. And then what they're talking about here is on the face as well, uh, for the trigeminal system and reflexes associated with the face. Um, definitely different than your typical electrical stem, right? So this is a pulsed radio frequency device, which has a global patent on um, the type of waveform it produces. Um, I'm seeing a lot of secretions since then. Is this normal or should I do something else? So uh, this is extremely normal, actually, um, and something that, that we do like everyone to understand if someone does start to struggle with, or if someone is already struggling with secretions, as we start to stimulate um, the symbaconcha, which is, again, part of it's the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. Um, and that obviously is a parasympathetic branch of the nervous system. Uh, this can, in some people, increase secretions. Um, we don't see it as much with stimulating the face, um, although it can happen with the face too. But typically, when you stimulate the face, that's more of a sympathetic stimulus. Um, I always tell people, you know, think about if someone were to slap you in the face, uh, that would make you mad and stimulate your sympathetic nervous system. Um, whereas when you do the symbaconscious stimulus via the stimulating the vagus nerve, that's more going to calm you down. Um, but again, you can increase the parasympathetic response and it's, it's typically transient, right? So it's not a long lasting thing where you start doing this type of procedure and you're going to forever have secretions, you know, at a higher level. What will happen is those networks those vagal networks and other networks um, are going to integrate and then you start to actually see an improvement in secretions. Um, so that's that's my answer with that. Um, obviously, you know, if it becomes to, if it begins to get out of control, right, we really start to see it, you know, start to um, be a problem, then you can reduce it if you need to. But I like to push through it if it's manageable so that we get that integration faster. So that's my thoughts on that. Um, and then can you share any research articles on how laser therapy helps? I have laser, but not sure how it helps in protocols super long and tedious to follow. Um, so what I'd rather do is teach you how to fish rather than, um, you know, giving you the, the fish directly, right? So let me show you. Um, actually, I think I had it pulled up. Um, what I want you to do is be able to go to Google Scholar. Um, so if you just go to Google Scholar, so um, here it says scholar.google.com, or you can just type in google.com uh, backslash scholar. Um, but this is where um, I typically go to start my research um, filtering. Um, from here, you'll be able to search whatever. So you can see, you know, my typical search uh, is typically around some type of photo by modulation. And so here's recommended articles. Um, and I'm signed up through Google Scholar to receive um, on a weekly basis the most up-to-date articles on uh, laser and light therapy. But let, let's say we want to do uh, research photo uh, biomodulation. Um, you know, the first thing that came up, right? Photo biomodulation for mental disorders. Uh, but you can say for brain, right? For brain disorders, brain injury. Um, and then that can be your search term. And then it's going to pull up, um, you know, any article that 
has those key terms or, you know, has some type of relation there. Um, I like to look at most recent research. So I'll, you know, you can come over here on the left and you can say since 2024, right? Um, or you can customize your range. Um, you can do all types of, um, you know, ways to, to really refine that search. Um, but that's, you know, that's what I would want you to do, right? I want you to actually start playing with this and going on Google Scholar because there's thousands of articles. Um, so rather than just pulling one and giving you, you know, that information, what I'd like for you to do is uh, really begin to explore the research and be able to, you know, really select the topics that you want to look at. Um, what I can tell you is as you start to look at the research, we need to understand several different things. Um, number one, um, we need to understand that um, you've always heard me talk about in vivo, in vitro, and all these things. We need to understand uh, how the study is being carried out. Is the study being carried out um, in a Petri dish, in a lab? Um, is it being carried out in a live human? Is it being carried out in mice? Is it being carried out in a other animal, in a different type of animal? Um, we also need to look at the device being used and then not just the device, but the device parameters. So, um, you know, if we look at a device that has a collimated beam, right? So it's just this, this, you know, straight, you know, collimated laser beam, that's going to deliver a dramatically different dose than if you were to use something like we use, right? So we're using um, a laser that has a diverging laser beam, right? So instead of being collimated, it's diverging. Um, dosages are dramatically different. And there's very little research done on this type of beam at the moment. Um, I'm doing some right now in a lab in San Marcos, um, and we're specifically looking at how uh, lasers, the lasers we use and the lasers I'm developing actually um, activate stem cells specifically. Um, but then we also have some other uh, research studies going right now. Um, so if someone starts to talk about, you know, a, a certain laser being deleterious for health just simply because of the power, then there has to be qualification around that because power is only one parameter. And laser safety is not simply defined around power. Um, there's actually several different um, mechanisms at play there. Um, there's a C6 value, there's a C4 value, and those are mathematical equations based on the physics of the laser beam. So that's where I don't like a lot of the, the rhetoric that's going on in the laser field right now, because just to be quite honest, no one actually understands the laser beam physics, and that's fine. If they're clinicians, I get that but I'm both a clinician and um, an inventor and developer here. Um, and there's, there's different engineering components and laser beam physics that need to be considered in these discussions. And to date, the research does not reflect that, right? So I, I hope that gives a little bit of insight into that. So whenever you review the literature, we need to qualify who's it being done in, how is it being carried out um, in the laser beam physics as well. Um, and something that I've identified as well that is really a problem in laser research and photobiomodulation research is there the majority of research is uh, research studies being done are actually being done under fluorescent lighting. So if we're studying light, well, we need to be aware of all the different forms of light that are actually coming in contact with the cells that we're studying. So, the fluorescent lights, unfortunately, I'm sitting under fluorescent lights. That's a high frequency light. It's 400 to 400 nanometers. Typically, um, if I'm studying a longer wavelength, like a red or an infrared, these two wavelengths do different things, right? So we need to account for that in our research. To date, no one has done that. Um, we're doing that. Uh, we're, we'll be the first ones that I know of to actually uh, uh, have that be a factor in our research. So again, we have to qualify the research and there's thousands of studies. Uh, so that's why, you know, I'd rather you go to Google Scholar and start to work through it yourself. Okay. 
Can you discuss vestibular therapy? Uh, what is it and how may it help TBI patients improve balance? So I love this topic. Um, I'm just going to switch to a uh, presentation I did. Um, I think it was last year, um, maybe a couple years ago, just to be honest. I don't really remember, but um, I love this topic. The, the vestibular system is rather complex. And it's so complex that when I was going through my initial training in functional neurology, uh, it quite frankly, it confused the hell out of me. Um, and so I decided, you know what, I'm going to just go to the textbook and teach myself. Uh, that's just how my brain works. That's how I, I prefer to learn. Um, and so that's what I did. So I made it make sense for me. Um, I love this little snippet from this article. Um, it's a small, beautifully formed and locked in the skull, the vestibular organs continuously bombard the brain with messages. The messages are quite unlike any others. They tell of accelerations, how the head is rotating and translating, uh, and its orientation in space. The messages never stop and cannot be turned off. Even when we are completely motionless, they signal the relentless pull of gravity, which is very important, right? Um, and so the vestibular system actually begins its development in utero. Um, and of course, you know, a baby should be upside down and you're floating in this, um, you know, this bag of water and you have these linear and rotational accelerations, et cetera. Um, and there's also an acoustic component to it. Um, but if you look at the different components and I'm giving you the broad level 30,000 view here, um, you have the otoliths, right? So the otoliths are your utricles and your saccules, um, and those develop first. Um, and in therapy, we need to consider this, uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, but then we have the semicircular canals. Those begin to develop next. Um, those have more to do with um, rotational accelerations. Um, all of these go into, let me see, where's my picture? I have a good picture here. Here we go. This whole system, right? So here you have the vestibular apparatus on the left. Um, they integrate and they go through the vestibular ganglion, right? But then as they go through um, the, the brainstem, here's where we have considerations. As you can see, we do have a direct route into the cerebellum, um, but here we need to integrate in the brainstem. So we have this big interplay of vestibular function with brainstem maturation and development but what I'll also tell you is that this is largely also based on the state of the cerebellum. So the cerebellum sits at the base of the skull, extremely important area of the brain. Um, it is, think of the cerebellum as a conductor, right? It's coordinating the immune system. It's coordinating our muscles. It's coordinating our thoughts. It's coordinating our inflammatory responses. It's coordinating a lot of things, but it also stabilizes our autonomics. So what I mean by that is when I say autonomics, think of like blood flow, right? It stabilizes blood flow. It stabilizes the, those autonomic nuclei in the brainstem, right? So what we do clinically is we have to first look at brainstem development and then cerebellar integration before, during, and after doing our vestibular rehab. These are methods that are proprietary to us um, just because of, you know, how I've thought through this process and developed our procedures. Um, but I have seen that if we think through it that way and we do that clinically, we get better balanced uh, vestibular function, right? Um, also, clinically, if we go back to the utricles and the saccules, these are more related to our postural reflexes. And so if we get pushed, right, that's a linear acceleration in one direction. Um, from a postural reflex standpoint, we should have the head riding reflex. Our eyes stay aligned with the horizon, um, and we should have a propping mechanism, a hopping mechanism, et cetera, to prevent a fall. Um, and that happens through a really cool interplay. So we get this push or, you know, we, we get a, a linear acceleration in one direction. The cerebellum kicks on, reads this and says, hey, I don't want to fall over. It contracts the muscles down the opposite side of the body to begin to pull you up via the vestibulospinal pathways. And then at the same time, you have these postural reflexes coming in for safety. 
like again the propping mechanism hopping mechanism um so that you don't fall over now if you can i know that's a lot of information we're drinking from a fire hose um you know but at the same time think of it this way if we don't have proper and balanced development um of those systems which i just described different systems not just the vestibular system so if these are not developing in a balanced coordinated fashion then we need to consider things like when do we start you know trying to crawl when do we start trying to get up and walk when right because i don't want to start gait training someone if they don't have postural reflexes kicked in if they don't have the vestibulospinal pathway starting to fire if they don't have utricular or saccule development right so we have to consider that and there's so many different ways from a therapeutic standpoint to integrate and to train those systems um, but this is a big system that touches pretty much every area of the brain um, i don't know if i have it in uh, this lecture but basically there's limbic uh, components too hmm. i may not have it in this in this lecture but basically um, Oh, that was a different topic. Um, basically, the vestibular system also touches and um, is very intimately connected to the limbic system. Um, this starts to talk about, um, you know, this is why when you have a screaming baby and you start to, you know, swing them uh, or move them or rock them or, or something like that, it's, it has a calming effect because then that vestibular system starts to gate and control the limbic, um, more emotional part of the brain. Um, this has interplay in things like locked in syndrome, uh, neurostorming, um, these types of things, right? So the vestibular system is rather complex. Um, it's a fun topic to, to geek out on. Um, but you know, I, I would love to do like a full lecture on it, but I, I don't know if that helps, but basically, um, we need to develop it. We need to, de to develop it in the, in the right order. Like I was saying, otolus first semicircular canals, but also how it's interacting with the brainstem and then how it's interacting with the cerebellum, but then at the same time, how the cerebellum is coordinating and uh, stabilizing the brainstem and the vestibular system uh, is extremely important as well, right? So we have to take into, into part all of those different considerations. All right. As a parent, of adult children with medical issues, I would like to know what training or education is required that will allow me to work in this field. Um, and I, I love this question. Um, we've had many, many um, caregivers, parents, caregivers, whatever um, it may be that have actually gone into the field, right? And um, there's so many different ways that you can do this that what I actually really love, like, it's just like, I was actually talking about this tomorrow, right? <laughs> tomorrow, talking about this, tomorrow, talking about this yesterday. I'm talking to someone about it again tomorrow, um, because a, a new station wants to do a story over one of our patients that, um, you know, started basically started in a coma, was not able to walk or talk, uh, did our therapies, you know, worked with us for about a year and a half, two years. Uh, and now he's actually, he's been an intern, uh, with us and now he's going to school to actually do what we do, um, which is just amazing, right. To, to be able to see that entire progression and see how, uh, he's really thriving. Um, there's so many different ways though. And what you need to do is you need to think about, um, what part of care you, you really have passion about, you know, being involved in. Is it from a nursing perspective? Is it nutrition? Is it you know, rehab more like what we're doing. Is it, um, regenerative medicine, which are, are things that we're doing too now, uh, like which component, you know, do you really like, and what do you want to focus on? Um, and then that will kind of define, you know, your, your different fields of training that you can pursue. Um, the, I mean, really the options are limitless. I, I know people that have even become a consultant, right? They, so that they consult with, um, brain injured, families because they actually had, I know a guy that actually had a brain injury uh, and now he consults with families on his experiences and 
helps in that regard. You know, obviously there's a gray area. You can't be a clinician in that regard, uh, but you can consult and give your opinion and, and help with those uh, various situations like that. So, so many different ways that you can, you know, really contribute to the world. Um, so different things to, to think through there. I hope that helps. Okay. So 13 year old son suffered a hypoxic brain injury uh, just over five years ago. He was healthy kiddo prior since the injury. He's in a wheelchair, completely dependent on someone and is nonverbal. Um, he's physically at a four month old, but cognitively he's at 13. Um, he's not able to get on all fours to learn to crawl again. Uh, we're still working on head control amongst many other things. Uh, we have your laser and Resimax. Is there anything we can do as a parents to help them get to the crawling position with head control or just a good starting point? We live in Wisconsin, would love to come visit, but our lives have not made possible yet. So um, you actually described some really good uh, things to potentially focus on here. Um, so we have to understand um, the how the motor systems develop. Um, and a lot, you know, I described the, a lot of the vestibular components already, but um, this ability to um, get on all fours and begin to work on crawling again, um, that actually starts to develop at the, uh, the CT junction, so where the neck and the upper back meet, right? So even just beginning to train uh, chin to chest, right? And not only just a concentric chin to chest, but an isometric chin to chest. So we'll usually have someone on their back. Um, what, you know, there's a certain way to hold the hands. We pull them up. We want them to, to be able to tuck the chin. That's a concentric, so contract and relax. But then we also want to be able to contract and hold. So moving from concentric muscle tone to isometric, that's how we build muscle spindles. Um, and that's how we build more ATP in the mitochondria. And the way that we go from the ability to just contract and relax to contract and hold um, is by having more ATP. I don't know if you hear the people in the room next to me. They're having a lot of fun with that kiddo right now. Uh, anyway, that we have to develop more ATP and more mitochondria in order to uh, have isometric tone where your muscles can contract and hold, right? And that's where we have to get for all movement. Um, but we start with those types of approaches where we're really developing that head and neck control. So we move from this plane, um, you know, chin to chest, and then we move to side to side, right? Um, and this is where we start to work on that otolithic uh, development. So the utricles uh, and then saccules is um, linear acceleration up and down. We use a, a swing, uh, some type of uh, head to toe uh, movement there for the saccules. Um, now from there, if we wanted to start looking at um, things like the ATNR, uh, the asymmetric tonic neck reflex, and the STNR, the symmetric tonic neck reflex, um, we actually can have the person on their back uh, and start to work through more of a passive approach to start to work ATNR and SDNR. Um, so for example, you can have someone um, turn the head uh, or have you know the patient themselves turn their head. Um, and then, so if I turn my head this way, this arm goes into extension, right? Uh, so it's almost like, it's like you're smelling your armpit, right? We're, we're initially initiating that, uh, that crawling reflex um, or the ATNR pose, the fencer pose, right? So this would be the, the fencer pose, but we can do it like this too. Um, so if we turn our head to the right, the arm, right arm goes into extension, left arm is in flexion, whether it's here or here, it's just, it just needs to be in flexion. Um, if my right arm is extended, then my right leg is also extended. So my right leg is straight and my left leg would be flexed. Um, so we would hold the pose and then change, right? Um, so you hold the pose and then change, hold the pose and then change. Um, that's one method to start to work on that passively. Um, then as things start to develop, we actually start to, to change that to where instead of having right arm extended, right leg extended with a right head turn, uh, we then change it to where right head turn, right arm extended, left leg extended, right? And so then we start to develop it that way. Um, and then what also is important uh, through this 
is as we start to see development, the rate of the head turns then starts to develop what's called fixed action patterns. Um, and so we do it slower at first. You know, you hold the head turn for a few seconds, chain sides for a few seconds, chain sides for a few seconds later, right? Then we start going with faster head turns. Uh, same thing, coordinating the bodies, coordinating the extremities. Um, and that's how we start to develop, again, those fixed action patterns, um, which if we think of a fixed action pattern, think about um, um, the, the motor cortex saying, hey, I want to crawl sends that information into the basal ganglia in the midbrain and the basal ganglia say, oh, I've developed this pattern. I know what muscles to move and how to move them so that you don't have to consciously go, okay, move my arm, move my leg, contract this muscle, contract that muscle. The basal ganglia goes, here's the fixed action pattern and shoots it down to the cerebellum and the, and the spinal cord. And then that that whole process is just set into motion, but we have to develop the fixed action pattern first, right? So this is just one strategy of many. So it's just one example of using a combination of, we have to convert muscle spindles from the concentric to the isometric phase, right? And we do that, like I was saying, you know, we first for focus on head and neck um, stability and development that translates into hand supporting. I didn't even touch on hand supporting. Um, but hand supporting reflex is where we get our shoulder girdle stabilization. Um, so stimulating this area of the, the hand right here specifically, whether it's vibration, manual massage, electrical stimulation. Um, when you stimulate this part right here, it reflexively contracts the triceps and that reflexively stabilizes the shoulder girdle muscle via the serratus anterior. Um, and so basically when you stimulate here, that's where the baby's on their, their tummy and they start to bring their hands in like this. They stimulate that part of the hand and then they reflexively get this more stable position to then start to lift and crawl. Um, so we go through converting muscle spindles, working on hand supporting, um, and then facilitating and integrating the ATNR and STNR. We didn't talk about STNR um, reflexes on the back and then start increasing the rate so that we then develop fixed action patterns. Um, that is one phase of that process, right? Um, there's other phases. Um, we have to look more into core, st core stability. We have to make sure the vestibular system is balanced and functioning like it should, um, et cetera, right? So there's other considerations, but that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, I hope that helped. I could talk about this subject for a very long time too. Okay, um, so my son spent a week at your clinic this summer. Uh, since then, I've been doing the prescribed therapy five days a week. Landon has seizures, expressive receptive language disorder, and mild intellectual disability. Since starting therapy, I haven't seen any noticeable changes. How can I know this is really helping him? When should I expect to see changes? At what point do I determine this is not working for him and move on? So great question. Um, I, I love that, you know, you, you asked the question um, and there are several things to consider here. So anytime we have seizures, um, we do want to also consider neurological autoimmunity. Um, so I didn't see anything on file um, and we, you know, would definitely want to pursue seeing if there is a neuro autoimmune component preventing um, integration, right? And so we always talk about those things um, in the intensives and time together as well. Um, and so that would be just kind of my first, you know, response is like, Hey, let's make sure that we, we've looked at all the things that we wanted to look at and that we, we need to look at. Um, and then from there, it's really just a, I would like to consult. I would like to say, Hey, you know, what's, what does this look like? Do we see maybe some some minor changes that uh, can lead to a more exponential rise in changes? Um, you know, we when we first start to look at um, if someone is really coming in with a seizure disorder, um, what we need to do is you know we're we're focusing on the trigeminal and the vagal systems largely um, because those systems in the research show that. Um, if you stimulate those systems properly, you can, in the study show, you actually get a reduction in pediatric epilepsy. Um, and so we, we first focus on that. 
Um, and then obviously, uh, then we start looking at other forms of development and ways that we can integrate systems. Um, but so I could talk about this from several different uh, perspectives. Um, one is through therapy, we do see exponential results, right? So we first start to see, you know, maybe little changes. Um, and then over time, they add up and you start to get this big curve up, right? You start to hit this, uh, you know, this point to where it's like, oh, wow, now we're really seeing a lot of changes. Um, that's common. And then what period of time is highly dependent on the individual, right? So for some people, maybe that happens in a week. For some people, months. For some people, maybe it's going to take a year or two. Um, no one knows, right? I'm, we don't know. No one knows. I have clinical assumptions just based on my experience, typically, but but no one really knows how long is it going to take in order to get these these big changes, right? Because we do very commonly have to go through that those initial phases where um, you know we need to integrate things in the brainstem and autonomic systems and things that are not so apparent from a behavioral standpoint. Um, so that can be one thing. Um, I did talk about seizures. Um, so we may need to, you know, look into that a little bit more. Um, and, you know, just really the concept of, you know, let's follow up, right? So I know that um, we recommend let's follow, let's follow up in four to six weeks. Um, and then if any challenges do arise, then we always want to follow up uh, there again, because um, it's it's not uncommon for us to do a follow up six weeks to two months, three months later, and we're changing the home care based on the feedback, right? So it's always important to you know adhere to the follow ups and make sure that we can really you know continue to you know to to be fluid and to make changes when necessary. Um, so that's I, I hope that helps. Um, would love to follow up. Would love to dig in a little bit and see. Uh, what we need to do on the case. Um, but I mean, really, if if we're not seeing results, then we need to we need to connect so that uh, we can figure out why um, and then make the appropriate changes uh, so that we can move forward. Right. OK, um, kind of a broad question, um, laser usage, how to activate neuroplasticity. My son suffered a near drowning. So um, I mean, I would say that this question is is extremely broad um, and difficult for me to really give a targeted response to. Um, so I guess in general, laser use, well, laser and light therapy in general under the right parameters are going to activate neuroplasticity. Um, light therapy in general activates things like BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factors, um, Growth, other growth factors, improves firing rates, et cetera. And that's just with general use. Um, I like to use, initially, I like to use the the lasers that we have over the carotid arteries and the um, vertebral artery, which is behind the ear, uh, because the carotids, um, if you use them over those main, main blood supplies going up into the brain, um, you can effectively influence the entire brain with secondary tertiary quaternary effects from the laser, right? So rather than using it directly on the head, we can go for the, the blood supplies first and still see an increase in oxygen, an increase in um, growth factors, an increase in, you know, all the good things that we see from laser and light therapy use. It's a great safe place to start, um, especially if I haven't consulted with anyone yet, um, you know, on the, on the case. So that would be kind of my first suggestion, but, um, you know, other than that, it's kind of hard to, to really get into the nitty gritty on this one. Um, so I would say initially let's use it over the carotid arteries, uh, and the vertebral artery. Uh, so we get that, you know, full brain expression of all the positive things that, um, you know, can come from laser and light therapy. Now, of course, you know, it, I, I don't know what, what device you're using or, considering using or whatever. So that's another discussion, you know, um, you can do that with other products. I just don't know the parameters, uh, in which to advise to use them in. Right. Um, so, all right. Red light panels, how often to use them on a child and for how long? So, um, love red light panels. I actually have one in my bedroom. My wife hates it. She put it in the garage. I brought it back in. Um, but 
it's it's a different approach than like a targeted approach like what we do with the lasers right so i use the lasers on my brain i use the light panel on my body just from a health and longevity perspective um i have my kids lay under the led panel i have my kids use the laser on their brain um so and we do actually have um red light panels now through neuro solution which is really cool because we're one of the only ones that we actually have um, the ability to pulse frequencies through the red light panel. So you can actually have a frequency of one to 40 Hertz. So that's really cool. Now I only have it pulsing, uh, via the infrared lights, not the red, because, um, the bright red intense light pulsing at those lower frequencies may stimulate seizures. And so we only pulse them in the infrared, which is the non-visible spectrum, um, to mitigate that. Um, so it's not a concern, um, but red light panels. So with red light panels, the closer they are to your body, the higher the dose. Um, so if they're like right over your body, you're going to use them for less time than if they're further away from the body. Um, the way that I typically dose, um, in a healthy individual is, um, I have them lay under it until they start getting that kind of, um, warm and kind of hot feeling like they've been in the sun, um, you know, for too long. So if you've been laying on the beach, um, and your, your skin starts to kind of get that kind of hot feeling, uh, and you're like, Oh no, I hope I'm not getting sunburned. You know, that kind of feeling, um, that's the dose at which you either stop or you increase the distance away from the body. Um, and you really lower the dose, right? Um, again, this is from the neck down. We don't want to have the bright lights like shining directly into your eyes for a prolonged period of time. You don't want that. There are studies actually using LED panels for visual acuity, um, but they, they were adhering to the blink reflex. And so they would not go past what was sensitive to the light. I don't remember the timing parameters for that. I think it was in like the five to 10 minute time frame, but it was for visual acuity. And they did actually see a 27% increase in visual acuity, which is a dramatic result for, um, for vision. Um, so for how long, again, I, I say to adhere to the, um, what I suggest in, let's see. Okay. All right. So we'll get, all right. I'll get to that question here in a little bit that just popped up. Okay, if a child sees your post stem cell therapy uh, for an intensive, can you laser? Can your laser? Can your laser therapy work on harnessing stem cells like how you do a PRP? Okay, so I think what you're asking is if a kiddo does stem cell therapy and then comes in for for an intensive, um, can we harness the stem cells like what we do with PRP? So I'll answer it like this. Um, the laser enhanced PRP procedure that we do in the office is proprietary. So um, you're not going to get the benefit of the actual laser activation of those stem cells. So the reason that we use PRP, so the platelet rich plasma, right? So we draw the blood, we spin it into PRP. In that solution, there's uh, growth factors, peptides, uh, several different cellular types one cell in there is called the V-cell, V-S-E-L, V-cell. Stands for very small human embryonic-like stem cell. The V-cell is a pluripotent stem cell. That means it can turn into anything. Um, the next step away from pluripotency is multipotency. So once a stem cell goes to a multipotent stem cell, which is the majority of stem cell procedures, those cells are limited in what they can turn into. Um, the V cell is also the smallest stem cell that we have in our body. It crosses into the blood brain barrier with no problem. It actually rapidly crosses into the brain. These are some of the things that really attracted me to the procedure and with really developing our use of um, uh, lasers on the V cells because V cells are dormant most of the time. And this is why no, well, there's two reasons why no one really uses V cells. Number one, they are extremely small. And most people didn't even think they existed. Some people still say they don't exist. 
Um, I'm working with one of the leading researchers in the regenerative medicine field, specifically that has done research on B cells. So he said, you know, he started these studies really thinking these B cells are too small, not a therapeutic benefit. We can't do this. And then he said, you know, he pulled up his most recent study and he was like, they are there, they are causing change. This is irrefutable. Like the research will continue to progress and show this. Um, and so what we've been able to do is um, actually activate these V cells with a very specific laser parameter. Now, the laser parameters are very different than the laser parameters uh, that we use in therapy, right? So we have to use a much, 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 much lower powered laser when we activate these stem cells in the test tube. Uh, so that's in vitro. Again, this goes back to what's the setting? Are the cells in the Petri dish? Are they in the human body? There's different parameters that need to be applied in these scenarios. So we have the laser set with certain beam cancellation, with a certain type of beam um, frequency, with a certain wavelength, with a certain pulse modulation that activates the V-cells. And we now have studies that show we do activate the V-cells. So that part would be missing, right? If you came to me from a different stem cell procedure. Um, the other part is when we readminister the PRP or this laser activated solution, we then use the laser on the tissue that we want those cells to adhere to or stick in, right? So if you talk to the leading researchers right now in stem cell therapy, they'll tell you, I can inject stem cells in your knee, but nothing is going to keep them there. They're immediately going to go into circulation and start to find things to fix. So we want to, number one, we want to activate those cells. Number two, we want those cells to go to work in certain areas. Usually we're looking at, you know, focused on the brain. And so we can use this laser now to alter surface receptor proteins in the tissue that we want these cells to stick in or focus on. So as this, we have about 30 minutes after we push the solution back into the individual, just through the IV port in the arm, 30 minutes, these cells are circulating. After 30 minutes, they found their home. So we're using the laser and we're, we're making sticky spots in the brain, the areas we want it, the cells to focus on, sometimes in the gut and the spine. And we've done it all over the body, literally all over the body. You know, I don't think there's an area that we have not lasered in this procedure uh, because we've done it on so many different um, situations thus far. Um, and so that's how we're increasing the specificity of this approach. Um, now, if you, however, if you come in right after getting stem cells done somewhere else, that's still great because what we can do is not just with the laser, but with our methods, we can actually increase um, the firing rate of the areas that we're trying to develop. So those stem cells um, essentially go to work really in those areas more, right? So, so there's different strategies that we can take depending on the situation. Um, but we can absolutely leverage and harness those stem cells, um, you know, no matter where you got them done. Um, if you come in, we can absolutely make those cells go to work faster and more efficiently for you. So I hope that makes sense. Cool. All right. So let me go to, uh, let's see, stop share. And then let's go to the chat here. So can you explain what the SABO and StemPod do and how they help? So the SABO device is a microcurrent device. Um, microcurrent is different from things like TENS unit from the pulse radio frequency. Um, I, I've used microcurrent um, initially when I started working in the hospital in the physical medicine um, uh, department, we, we would typically use microcurrent because it is most often used for neurological rehab. Um, so that's why I like microcurrent. It has a rich history with neuro rehab, um, but it's also more comfortable for the patient. So obviously we're seeing a lot of kids um, to be able to get the same results, you know, with a TENS unit, you just have to have it up. You, you have to turn it up a lot higher. Now you can still get good results with a TENS unit. Don't get me wrong. But a TENS unit is designed to um, stimulate 
the uh, receptors a little bit more superficial. Um, they're not necessarily designed for neurological rehab per se. So that's the that's the shtick with the Sabo. It, um, the other thing is most microcurrent devices are pretty big. Uh, they're getting smaller. They're like literally every year there's really cool devices. But this was uh, the first device that I found on the market that was small and was a really good quality microcurrent device. And I love all the different programs that it has in it. And so depending on what we're trying to do, we can change the program. Um, so that's the Sabo. Now they have other products too. And I'm assuming you're talking about the Sabo Stem Pro. Um, they have a glove, they have, um, they have various different devices. I, I know the owner, um, the founder of Sabo, he's a occupational therapist, super good guy, super great guy. Um, very smart and I love the products they develop. So, um, Stempod, Pul again, pulsed radio frequency. Um, so it's a different waveform, the waveform that they have developed they've proven increases mitochondrial genesis. And so it actually increases the amount of mito mitochondria in the cell. And again, you heard me talk about the importance of mitochondria um, with muscle spindle conversion and muscle development. And then also with uh, obviously mitochondrial, I'm sorry, neurological development. Um, and so that is a very unique quality to the stem pod uh, and why we, I have personally found it highly effective, um, especially when it comes to the vagus nerve, the vagal system, primitive reflexes. Like for example, if I want to integrate a palmar reflex, right? Okay. We can stimulate the palm. We can vibrate it. We can massage it. We can do all those things, but what are we trying to do? We're trying to have a sensory stimulus that fires a motor response. And that motor response is what is connecting to the brain and actually integrating it and developing it, right? So primitive reflexes are just sensory motor loops. That's all they are. So if we're trying to fire muscle spindles, we're trying to create that motor response with a sensory stimulus. So if I can take that stem pod and fire a stronger contraction, right? Then I'm going to integrate that brain network faster and, um, and integrate that reflex faster, right? So that's one of the concepts, again, that's proprietary to our methods. Uh, we were the ones that that developed that, um, those methodology, that methodology, et cetera. Um, so I, I hope that helps, but we, we use the stem pod all over the body, no joke, face, tongue, uh, solar plexus on the abdomen. Um, I mean, for sensory reasons, for pain reasons, you can put it, you know, if you have back pain, you put the pin right on the area of pain. Very simple way to use it. Um, we use it to fire the paraspinal muscles, the muscles going up and down the back, you know, to help with crawling and walking and all of those things. We use it on in the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. You can use it back here uh, in that pure patch area for the vagus nerve. You can use it on the face for the trigeminal system. I mean, there's so many different ways to use it. Um, and honestly, we're still creating more. That's why I actually spoke with the, um, the manufacturer the other day and they always check in, uh, okay, how are you using it now? Um, and so it's really cool, but that's, you know, I could go on and on about the stem pod. I love it. We use it so many different ways. So hope that helps. Um, does anyone have any other questions? I either put everyone to sleep or I answered the questions. That's awesome. Okay. Um, Rhonda, you still there? Maybe not. Is anyone there? <laughs> oh, no. Did everyone drop off? What's going on? All right, so I guess I'll pause the recording.